Hi, I'm Mariel Fink. I'm a senior in landscape architecture. Hi, I'm Kalindi Parikh. I'm a senior in city and regional planning. Uh, and this May, we went to Cambodia to study the sacred landscapes of two of the major cities of Cambodia, Siem Reap, which is famous for uh, the, or being the home to all of the ancient Angkor temples, and Phnom Penh, which is famous as the capital of Cambodia and also a center of uh, political conflict in the past century. Um, so before we get started, I want to um, kind of give you a structure of how we're going to present. Um, we're going to give you a quick background on the religious and political history of the country um, and then kind of talk about how conflict shaped what the country looks like today and how it is now. Um, and then we'll move on to how the, um, how the cities will move towards the future, so with the sacred rebirth uh, versus the civic rebirth, and we'll kind of explain more of that as we go. So just a brief history of Sim Reap. It's uh, the home, again, to the Angkor temples, uh, the original uh, location of the ancient Angkor Empire, which uh, flourished between 900 AD and 1200 AD. A lot of the temples, um, the older temples, have um, many Hindu symbol, uh, symbols, sculptural elements, uh, emblematic of the Hindu uh, re religion, which was prevalent in the early or 900s, uh, and then show a good transition between um, Hinduism and Buddhism, where Buddhism became the prominent religion in Cambodia around 1200. So there's a mixture of different um, Buddhist and Hindu, Hinduist symbolism or symbols throughout the temples. Uh, but more importantly, they become a symbol of national identity, uh, a symbol of resilience as they've uh, endured so many years um, in spite of a lot of the political turmoil that has happened. So uh, a brief history of the last century in Cambodia. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a uh, there was the um, change in political regime from the um, people's, or to, from the People's Republic of Kampuchea to the Democratic Republic of Kampuchea, which uh, was the um, political party behind the Khmer Rouge, which uh, led to the genocide of uh, a third of the population of Cambodia. So it was fairly substantial. Uh, and it also resulted in a lot of iconoclasm, so a lot of destruction of the religious elements uh, throughout the entire country. Uh, almost every religious emblem was destroyed, but the uh, temples remained intact uh, at, because of their status as um, a symbol of the national identity. So they were seen more as, um, as a return to the past than as religious structures. And uh, that even shows today uh, as they um, are portrayed in tourism. So many of the temples are still uh, still well maintained. They've been restored um, in the past uh, decade. And uh, they, that's largely in response to the large amounts of tourists who have come into the country since the end of the Khmer Rouge to witness the ancient temples. Um, so a little bit more background on the Khmer Rouge. So previously to the Khmer Rouge, um, Cambodia was a monarchy and they actually, you can kind of see some of the religious architecture kind of translated into their royal palace. This was kind of their center of government. Um, but right after, in the late 70s, when the Khmer Rouge came into power, they were able to wipe out approximately the estimate 2 million people, with about half being from executions and half being from famine. Um, their idea behind, or their ideology was to have a, an agrarian society, so everyone who had any educational or religious background uh, would be killed, even to the extent that people who wore glasses as a sign of you know, being scholarly or who had soft hands, that meant they didn't work in the fields, they would just be executed. So it was a really terrible, um, really terrible genocide. And so this right here is in the capital. Sorry, I'm making everyone really sad right now. Um, this is in the capital. This is called um, the Twil Slang Genocide Museum. This was a school that was converted into kind of a detention center where people would later be moved into this place called the Killing Fields to be executed. Um, so it was really a haunting place because this genocide happened and it ended in like approximately 1979. So it's extremely recent um, and it was probably like one of the most depressing places I've ever been. But um, so this image on the right here is a spirit house that you kind of see everywhere throughout the country. It's kind of a symbol of, um, it's like ancestor kind of uh, appreciation, respect, and people here were leaving um, bracelets uh, kind of as a blessing to the people who had died there. So uh, it's interesting kind of the return to religious uh, spirituality as a result of 
of the terrible tragedy. So given this tragedy, um, it's astounding that not very many people know about it throughout the world, but that's also um, in part to the, or due to the fact that most of the tourism that comes into Cam or Cambodia goes to Samri or Samrib to see the ancient temples. So that's the image that uh, most of the world has come to see. And it, uh, most people come and see the ancient temples, and they're, again, the symbol of national uh, strength and resilience. And they uh, give this uh, feeling of optimism for a better life and kind of a, or draw attention away from the recent political tragedies. Um, so it just generally creates a much more positive image than what um, anyone actually is aware of in the country. Uh, but it also creates a problem with, uh, with religious com or com the commodification of the religious symbols, which end up becoming more of tourist items. And you can see um, the top, on the top images, there's a few, um, those are tourist shops selling little Buddhas and symbols that you would get in the temple as souvenirs, uh, kind of detached from their actual religious meaning. And next to it is um, religious symbolism, uh, sculptures or sculptural elements in hotels that uh, visitors would stay at. So it kind of, um, it kind of lessens the uh, importance of the religious elements that you would see in the city, but at the same time, uh, the rest of the city is so inundated with religious elements that um, you, it doesn't really change the significance of them for the Cambodian people. Um, so the actual religious uh, life of the Cambodians is much different than uh, the one that we perceive, uh, or at least the tourists perceive going to the temples. The, uh, the temples that people actually still inhabit um, within the city are much more uh, active. They, people actually live there. It's much more of um, a domestic feeling than a monumental feeling, with, as with the Angkor temples. So uh, these temples actually uh, kind of, it, it's ironic, they have a lot less attention given to them than the Angkor Wat temples. So you can see um, in this photo, there's a few images of the um, stupas covered in trash. The stupas are the tall golden burial mounds. Uh, so there's a lot less attention being paid to the actual religious life than the um, more iconic view of the religious life uh, portrayed at the temples. So now we kind of want to look forward and see what is happening now, what efforts are being made to kind of restore this religious life or perhaps maybe move away from it. So with Siem Reap in particular, this is these are images from a temple called Bang Malaya, which is about two hours outside of the city and kind of more recently discovered. Um, it's been abandoned for a really, really long time, so you can tell it's, it doesn't have a lot of preservation efforts going on, but they're just starting now. So the woman on the right, her name is Sray. She is one of the kind of um, guards there. She kind of works there. She managed to help us literally climb through the temple, which was really neat. Um, as we were some of the few tourists. But the amazing thing about this temple is that it's located by some, you know, some very vibrant village life. Uh, it's so far outside of the major metropolis, uh, uh, met metropolis but it's, it's kind of a home to these children that live here. They kind of play with it like, a, like we would play with a playground. Um, so this uh, temple is not so much of a monument, but as a home for this religious life. And I thought that was really, really valuable. Um, and so Siem Reap is really seeing this rebirth of religion. Uh, for example, the man on the left, his name is San Kong. We got to talk to him. He's a monk who is studying English right now. Um, and just to emphasize how recent this genocide was, his grandparents were both killed by the Khmer Rouge and his parents were both forced to do labor um, in the fields to produce like, you know, the agriculture to be this agrarian society. Um, so his family had been so far away from education for so long, and everyone in his village as well, that he came to the city to learn to read and write, to speak English, and to write in Khmer as well, um, so he could move back to the country and bring education back to a place that for so long had been without it. Um, so he was really interesting. We're still friends on Facebook. Monks can use Facebook, which is really cool. Um, so, you know, he's really a good example of how religious life is kind of re reborn in the modern age, how, it's, um, how he uses technology to kind of spread it. And he also works with some um, nonprofits for children and stuff too, so that's neat. Um, and I think you can really see with the younger populations that culture and education are really reborn 
Uh, for example, we went to um, a circus, which is on the left, that takes kind of underprivileged kids who want to learn either circus acts or painting. It's kind of a bigger organization for arts in general. And they interpret these old religious fables and religious stories into their acts, which was really cool, which just, you know, 30 years ago would have been punished or shunned. Um, and the picture on the right is kind of a, it's a newly built school. Um, so they kind of have the ability to recreate education even though it's not accessible to everyone at the moment, there um, there's a clear effort, and it's you know it's not being punished, and it's kind of they're really proud of it there. So that's really really nice. And with the cultural and educational rebirth, we also see a huge resurgence in religious symbolism throughout the city, uh, trying to recreate the um, pervasive Buddhist uh, er, environment that they had before the Khmer Rouge destroyed all of their religious symbols. So. Uh, the two pictures on the left are monuments uh, from Phnom Penh, so the religious uh, sculptural, or sculptural elements are used uh, to tell stories of um, t or tell stories of the past conflict and overcoming it, and uh, become more of a memorial element, uh, sort of linking the um, tragedies of the past to um, the resurgence of religion and hope in the culture, uh, and. Uh, the farthest uh, right image is actually um, a picture we took at the Buddha factory, which is the place where they're remaking all of the sculptural elements that were destroyed during the Khmer Rouge uh, to replace um, them throughout the city. So they're really actively trying to uh, recreate um, the important Buddhist environment that uh, they lost during the Khmer Rouge. So this is a really cool comparison, we think. Um, on the left you see Siem Reap and on the right you see Phnom Penh. So Phnom Penh being the civic center, um, the center of all the progress in the country, has the ability to kind of move past the conflict, um, memorializing it, understanding it, appreciating the people who, you know, the people who died, but being able to move past it into a new civic rebirth. Um, so you can see like the crazy amount of skyscrapers, construction, everything that's going on there, whereas Siem Reap is so physically connected to spiritual life with the temples being there that they use this opportunity to kind of re, uh, rebirth their spiritual life. So there's kind of a divergence here of Phnom Penh being a civic rebirth and Siem Reap being a spiritual rebirth. Thank you. Also note we are taller than the average Cambodian in the year 900. <laughs> All right, thank you.